Hey, and welcome. I'm Thomas McMahon with ClickBank. We are very happy to be here with Max Webb and Anna. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, very happy to sponsor and to be presenting to y'all today. As you might know, I'm gonna be covering 2022 marketing trends, things we're seeing going on here. I'm Thomas, I'm a biz dev manager. I'll just chat a little bit about why I'm here and not someone else from ClickBank. Um, I've been in internet marketing for, gosh, almost 10 years now. It's getting close. I've been, it's actually official, six years with ClickBanks in those 10 years. I just got an uh, email from HR last night congratulating me on six years <laughs> of service. So it um, feels like it's been two years, but it's been a blast. In that time, I've helped onboard two to $300 million in sales, which means could be a seller with a product selling their service or their goods or their offer on ClickBank, could be affiliates bringing traffic to said offers, could be establishing channel partnerships um, and kind of making sure that everything works well together. So that's kind of my role here at ClickBank is doing that, which means I get to see a lot. I've seen a lot change. I've seen some things not change, surprisingly. Um, and what we're obviously in this period of growth and uncertainty, which keeps dragging out with COVID, that's changed e-commerce and direct response in some big ways. We've seen some big shifts and trends in different regulation sectors, if you want to call it. We've seen platforms like Facebook and Apple fighting. And we're going to be covering all these things here and kind of highlighting where we think things are going in 2022 um, as these winds start to shift and how you can be pivoting or at least be mindful of how you're marketing and how you're thinking with that. So let's dive in. Facebook's dead. <laughs> as we all know, um, Facebook has been under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of turmoil. And no, of course, Facebook isn't really dead. It still works very well. It's still one of the biggest traffic sources on ClickBank. A lot of volume still comes from Facebook, but it's changing very rapidly, right? And who knows how it continues to change as government regulation starts to look like antitrust things might happen to them. So lots of shifting here, public opinion of Facebook is going down, users are going down. Again, it's still one of the biggest traffic sources, so I'm not trying to like mock this right. It's not actually dead, but it is tough. It's getting tougher to market on for the affiliate marketer. And there's a few reasons for this. And it's why when we talk about some trending topics and, or excuse me, some trending traffic sources in a little bit here, why that's the case, because people are having to leave Facebook because things are happening. Like, our CPAs, our cost to acquire to a customer um, or get the action we want are going up. Just, out, they're just increasing. Facebook is literally um, just making it more expensive. <laughs> it's not going up because bigger brands are bidding higher or it's Q4 and you know uh, e-commerce is bidding big. I mean, those things happen, elections happen, right? Things fluctuate, they add cost. But Facebook literally said, we're increasing the cost to run ads on Facebook. They are literally taking um, their user base, their ad buyers, the people running ads on Facebook and using that to generate profit and more profit for Facebook because they can, because they know people will pay it. So what does that mean for you, the marketer, or the affiliate marketer maybe? It means it's gonna get tougher to get those conversions. You'll have to get either better conversions or better payouts on your commissions from those conversions in order to keep kind of that profit margin you had or get comfortable with tighter profit margins or more diversified revenue streams, which we'll cover here in a little bit too. So Facebook's getting harder. Conversion campaigns are getting harder to do, right? That's how I know a lot of affiliates like to run is attention grabbing ad, you know, kind of some crazy image goes to a pre-lander usually now because Facebook doesn't like going direct to the sales page. So it goes to some sort of pre-lander or warm up, and then to the offer. And you're trying to just get day zero, day one sales from your ad campaigns and get commissions for them. Well, that's getting harder and harder to do. Um, again, because partially because it's getting more expensive, but also just because bigger brands are getting smarter with their marketing and the, the tactics and the hacks are getting a lot harder to do. You're seeing Facebook ad accounts getting shut down at a more rapid rate than ever. They're getting harder to establish. It's getting harder to run the kind of the tactic-y, hacky kind of things, which means that 
what I call the big business marketing is going to win in the long run here. Um, and this is what the big players do already and what the big internal brands do already. And what I mean by this is driving campaigns that are awareness focused first, and then you bring someone through engaging posts, and then you're taking someone that's really warm and kind of used to the brand or the offer, then you're getting them to convert, almost more of an e-com style, if you will. I would, we did a great interview with Kurt Molly, um, who has the belt method, and he explains this really well in a podcast episode. I'll tell you how to get that at the end of this presentation. Um, but it's just thinking differently about how you need to market across really any channel, not just Facebook, but, as you start to kind of level up your skills as an affiliate and realize that conversion, 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 conversion is less likely to work. And how can you play within the landscape of a Facebook, like going for view campaigns, going for likes, going for kind of these different types of segments that keep someone on Facebook, because that's what Facebook wants. And then when they're really, really ready, giving them a conversion focus campaign and then getting them to buy. Those are kind of ways we're seeing people adapt and pivot and the bigger players operate. Again, this is probably, I don't know if it's a 2022 trend, but it is starting to happen. And the sooner you kind of get your head around, how can I actually build a robust marketing system that isn't just hack, 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 and get a conversion, you're gonna get out of that churn and burn cycle and build something a lot more sustainable. And then this is a big thing with iOS, with Facebook and Apple fighting and duking it out and making it hard to track. Exact tracking through these funnels and through this kind of Facebook to different devices, it's not going to be perfect. So if you rely on 90% plus accurate tracking, that's just not the reality anymore. And it's not going to be the reality moving forward. Like you're going to have to be okay with a margin of error. And that's something Kurt talks about too. So I highly recommend you go check out that podcast episode. But what I mean by this, it's like if you're tracking and you just understand that, okay, this campaign, because we can tell that this is the only uh, let's say it's a Facebook ad, right? And you're going to conversion event and you're seeing four sales here, but Facebook's reporting two, right? Let's, let's use a bigger data set. Let's say a hundred sales here, Facebook's reporting 80. Um, but you know that this is the only page getting traffic. Well, now you know there's a 20% margin of error for more. So you know that, okay, Facebook's are just under reporting. So we can't assume that they know what they're talking about. So let's assume that there's 20% margin of error so we can spend up to 20% more, for example, and kind of keep going. Or it might be the other case, right? You might actually be 20% less. So you have to kind of scale that down. And you have to kind of think a little smarter through this because it's not gonna be as transparent anymore moving forward as these different brands tighten up the data. Which brings us to our next point. It's party time. Uh, I wish this was a happy trombone noise, but it's a sad trombone noise. It's not a great party. It's, you can't rely on third party data, right? So Facebook's locking things up, uh, Apple's locking things up with iOS 14 and 15 and kind of different email parts. And so the fact that you can't rely on third party data anymore to really maximize your perfect targeting to an audience or who these audiences are means that the big shift is gonna be on moving to first party data. First party just means you control the data. You kind of you get to segment it and control it, which you know, you're not using Facebook to tell you what this audience is or Google or Apple, you're using your own data to do, which how do you even do that? The easiest way to do that is email. Okay, so collecting email, understanding email, whether it's leads or customers, you can segment this, right? You can start to quiz, you can bring them in through a certain lander, you know they bought on, or they know they opted in on a health list, or you know they bought a supplement, or you know they converted on a checklist for making more money online or working from home, right? You start to segment interest, you start to segment by demographic, you start to kind of segment with quiz funnels, and this is how you start to build robust first party data. At the bare minimum, you want to just segment based on buyer or lead or interest, right? And then you can start to target them differently. And for the cold traffic, paid media people listening to this, you can still leverage this. And this is what we're seeing a big shift happen with some of these big media buyers. They're driving from, you know, uh, ad placement on native or Facebook or Google, whatever it might be to bridge page lander. They're collecting leads on those bridge pages and landers before sending or as they send traffic to the conversion event. And they're building up a leads list. They're marketing and sending affiliate offers to that leads list, finding out who the customers are, segmenting them differently, keep selling products to those people. And they're starting to build out this first party data with email. Email is still a very vibrant traffic source. It's probably one of the, let's say Facebook, 
kind of just some different traffic sources like native, YouTube, et cetera, get thrown in there. And then email is like the biggest traffic source on ClickBank. So the more email you have, the more robust kind of uh, marketing efforts you've got and you can go from there. So let's dive into this a little bit. Email trends. Compliance with email service providers is continuing to change too. You see a kind of compliance and this focus on user experience ratcheting up on Facebook, on Google, on and then ESPs are quickly following suit. You've, um, you might have heard of people getting banned on certain things or getting their accounts shut down at ESPs because they're breaking terms or kind of, they're really tightening up. What this means is this often happens when you get listed on spam. And a really easy way to get listed on spam is if you're just taking swipe file from offer owner A, and it's like, oh, this is a risk for any swipe file, great. Subject line, body copy, and just throwing it into your email list and then blasting it out. That is, has a good or better chance of looking like spam because if affiliate B, right, your colleague over there, did that and like blasted it and someone reported it as spam. Now it's very easy for spam house and these other kind of third party spam watch list to flag that type of copy you're sending as spam. So if you send that same copy that was targeted as spam, now you are classified as a quote unquote spammer. So the trick here is to write at least 40% unique creatives with the email swipes you're sending out. If you are sending out email swipes from a third party, like a vendor or someone offering you that or a seller, or, um, you know, publisher, whatever you want to call it. So if you're collecting those email swipes, you want to be customizing that to your brand's voice, to your voice, to make it more unique and compelling, um, and then really engage them and send it out uh, with, and reduce the chance of you looking like that and abiding by the terms. The other big thing is, if you're just sending from, you can get more aggressive with email, right? And go directly from email to offer with just a click, with a ClickBank tracking link, for example, or Maxwell tracking link, or any other type of tracking link. But if you send it to a domain you own that the person opted in on, like a bridge page, if you're building your own bridge pages to send to, there's a few benefits to doing this. It's gonna look a lot more trusted to the ESPs because you're sending to a constant, consistent domain, and then that domain is warming up and sending to the conversion. Um, what you can also do is you get better data there, right? Third-party data is going away, but you can still get some really good data from that lander. If you, for example, think you've got a list of you know, mostly male-centric people, but you've got Google Analytics on your bridge page, and it's telling you, wow, this audience really skews 50-50 or more towards women, you might go, oh, I need to really tailor and maybe test different types of offers. So if you can control that flow more, the more data you'll get and be able to really build that first-party data better, and you'll look a lot cleaner with your ESPs. Because clean is kosher. And what I mean by this is not just trying to alliterate three Cs and Ks here, but what I mean is Sending clean will keep you clean, but also cleaning up your list regularly, right? You wanna really take inactives off. You wanna be able to kind of prune those on a daily or weekly basis and not send them as much or kind of stop sending them if they're not engaging. Because, you know, open rates are getting harder to see with iOS 15 and some different, you know, Facebook locking things up, but click-through rates are really important. And how can you boost your click-through rate? You send to a more engaged segment. And that's how you can start segmenting and sending different types of content to different types of people. The more you kind of segment, the more you send more tailored content, the better click-through rates you get, the healthier relationship you'll have with your ESP, the more money you'll make. You will not have to worry about things getting shut down and pivoting and losing a bunch of money and opportunity cost. So that's what I mean by clean by kosher. And here's a little bet metric for you. If 30 to 40% of your revenue as a marketer isn't coming from an email list, that's a big lever you can be pulling, right? And if you're just a pure affiliate, just driving traffic to offers, that might be 0%. You might go, oh, okay. So that could be a very big lever for you to work on in 2022 is how can we start building an email list to monetize and add that in as a revenue stream. It's not as sexy as, you know, scaling to 1,000 sales a day on Facebook, but if you start generating 10, 100, 150, 200, 500 sales here, right? How many, how many do you have to start generating on a weekly basis with an email list for it to be worthwhile to you? It might be a year plus project, but you're all of a sudden you've got this asset you can leverage indefinitely if your ad account gets shut down, if this traffic source dries up, and X, Y, Z. And you can point people to new things to start warming up campaigns even faster for you. So it's a very leverageable asset. We have another podcast in the, um, interview we did with Jimmy Kim, um, the owner of Sendlane, one of the big ESPs in the direct response marketing space out there. Yeah, I'll show you how to get to those um, podcasts here in a sec, but I'd highly recommend checking that out if you want more details on that. And let's go into some trending traffic sources from there. So I've alluded to a few of these, but 
YouTube has come up in a big way. Y'all are probably aware. That's one of the biggest growers I've seen on ClickBank is, you know, kind of affiliates that were typically on Facebook or diversifying different avenue streams. YouTube has been the go-to place for a lot of people, um, partially because they've been less strict with compliance. It's been easier to work with. I expect that to tighten up as well, but you know, you kind of need creatives. You need similar creatives that you'd run on Facebook, but there's a lot of tools now out there to kind of make quick via little VSLs or kind of voice AI if you don't want to be far, part of it. So YouTube has been really trending up on the types of direct ads you can run there. I've seen people run straight whole VSLs as a YouTube ad that usually burns out the VSL campaign on a much shorter window, but it can convert well still. So lots of ways to hack and kind of go into YouTube. Native is another big one. I know Anna talks to Native quite a bit and it can be a very lucrative traffic source. Um, if you look at the Facebook kind of a, what do we call a shutdown, right? <laughs> when Facebook went down a few weeks ago, um, you saw these native traffic sources blow up because people were now on MSN again, all these places again. And it kind of shows the reliance on a single traffic source can be really tough to use. On the same boat, we've seen people moving to native or, or existing native affiliates who've always done well in native, they've been able to scale up big because COVID has really brought a lot more people online than ever before. Right, we thought that internet was saturated. Now it's getting to a point of like your, you know, your great grandma who had never brought, been on a smartphone as an iPad and is scrolling through stuff on MSN and Yahoo and you know these different organic sites and they're seeing native ads all over the place. So native can do very well if you're not exploring that. I would highly recommend taking, checking out some talks by Anna or others on how you can leverage that. TikTok, right? That's a huge one for an organic and a paid traffic source. Their compliance is super strict, but we've seen some big traffic coming from TikTok. What I love about the TikTok experience is that the ads look incredibly organic. You can't really tell it's an ad. They're, it's one of the best native platforms, in my opinion. Like with Facebook, right? It's sponsored. It's You can't really tell. On TikTok, you have no idea if you're watching an ad or not. You might look like a sponsored post, but you can't tell if it's a direct conversion ad, and the linking out from there can be very good. You need your creative team to be on it and you need to be really testing a lot there and be mindful of compliance, but it's a huge traffic source that you can get access to on both the organic and the paid side. And then organic as a whole, this is a funny term for affiliates because organic is not a sexy uh, avenue stream to use because it takes a long time to build or that's the perception of it. But if you look at what I was talking about with email, if you look at the reliance on a single traffic source like a Facebook that can go away or shut your ad account down, building out organic content that is leverageable across multiple platforms builds a base for you. And it might take quote unquote years for you to really see efforts from your traction, but you'll start seeing you know, uh, results from your, track or from your efforts. Wow, that was a weird way to say that. Day one, it just might you know, take a while to amass, but you build out this content and you can use it across multiple channels and it builds in a whole new acquisition stream for you that can really feed your paid efforts too. Here, here's an example. Let's say, let's look, let's look at someone selling cookbooks, okay? Um, maybe let's say keto cookbooks or paleo or some different types of cookbooks out there. What would be a very natural thing for them to do? Right? They can go direct free plus shipping cookbook funnels, right? They can scale those with affiliates and email and Facebook and all that kind of good stuff. But a very natural thing for them to do would be to have a blog with keto and paleo and different recipes on it, right? And that's going to get exposed to Google and they can do YouTube ads, they can, or not ads, excuse me, they can do YouTube videos on different recipes. They can be on these gigantic search networks, building out organic, they can build out social pages. The social pages can feed their audiences for their paid campaigns. They can be generating leads off of their organic uh, blog posts and recipes and downloads and sending them through a paid funnel. They're building out an email list across all of these things, right? And this big email list now is what they can use to monetize with other affiliate offers, with other cookbooks they roll out. They can have this audience to test new products so they don't have to test on paid uh, you know, expensive Facebook campaigns. They can just, hey, we've got a new offer. We have a new hooks to test. Let's send it to our email. Let's see which ones resonate the most with our audience and then roll those best ones out and start split testing on Facebook. It builds out this huge thing you can start leveraging. The cool part is too now, let's say you've got YouTube channel with different recipes or whatever's out there. You can start slicing up bigger pieces of content into smaller pieces of content for Instagram Reels, for TikTok, for Facebook Stories, for LinkedIn, we'll probably have them soon, right? For these different micro video snippets and then podcasts. You can start diversifying your content out. And as you build this library, 
the next TikTok that pops up that's getting all this organic exposure for free, you can start slotting your existing content in this different swipes into those new organic traffic sources and build out these channels way faster than your competitors to, could who haven't done that yet. So you start to amass yourself with this arsenal of different content that you can use across the web, across paid, across free, across organic, and build out that baseline and be take a more you know, long-term approach to things. And then Twitch. Twitch is a surprising one that's been coming up. They're really leaning into um, kind of, you know, events almost. So if you're kind of a biz op internet marketing seller, right, I'm, I won't be surprised if we start seeing people do like webinars on Twitch, for example. They make it very easy to monetize. They can pay you directly a lot easier than YouTube can, but even though that's not the hook, you can send out links to your people to click on. You can do like, you know, kind of little things for people to buy or get questions asked. So I expect we're gonna see marketers leaning into Twitch um, going into 2022, if not 2023, because I think it's people assume it's just for gamers, but that's changing. Spotify as well. The ads you can run on Spotify now across their different podcasting channels, across the different you know, music streaming, is pretty compelling. Like I'm not an expert on this, but I think we're gonna see a lot of people leveraging these new traffic sources with, as these different um, platforms that have amassed lots of eyeballs or ears and have uh, started to open up different ad platforms for you to leverage. So that's where, like it, you saw this with Pinterest, you know, three or four years ago, it became a great place to run ads for super cheap or Snapchat even before they've kind of trended down. So I think Spotify and Twitch are kind of some of those next ones that are going to be a lot more easier for marketers to leverage that aren't just big brand plays like O'Reilly Auto Parts on Spotify or something, right? You can start to leverage that as an affiliate or as a brand or as an offer owner. And then going a little more niche into that is the actual podcasting platforms. People are able to run, you know, dynamic ads now across podcasts. It doesn't have to be something that set it and forget it. But even if it was, you can start to see there's a podcast have exploded over the last three years, especially with COVID. And there's so many avenues out there to kind of get into these niche markets and kind of run these paid CPM campaigns almost just like you would on a native ad platform, but for podcasts. And it can be great, whether it's a sponsored listing by the person actually talking who's hosting, whether it's a little slotted in ad that the agency's running, there's lots of ways to leverage podcasts and get traffic from those. And it can be a great way, especially if you're leveraging organic. Again, repurpose. I, I mentioned this twice because people think doing organic is just like, oh, I did this, I move on to the next thing. The good brands, right? They're taking their content. I honestly follow Gary V on TikTok and you'll see what I'm talking about because uh, what he, Gary Vaynerchuk, because what he's doing, if you will follow him on TikTok, they're taking all these old pieces of content from talks he gave 10, 15 years ago and new, really fresh stuff. And they're layering it in and sprinkling it through. They take a little snippet, they put it on TikTok. They do a, you know something new for YouTube shorts and put it on TikTok, right? They're repurposing all this content and makes this viral stuff. You'll see a lot of more marketers too on there doing the same thing. And they're getting a lot of organic exposure and then paid exposure too through TikTok or different organic. So you can really repurpose even old stuff and bring it on. So I want to hit that twice because the good marketers are doing it twice or even 4x over. So we're getting close to wrapping up here. I'm going to talk about the rich niches, which is if you say niches, this rhyme doesn't work. So the rich niches. So the niches out there that work are that are trending right now, survival and right wing politic, right? Those are still very big. There's a big vibrant community under that, even though Donald Trump's been banned on all those different social networks, there's still a big viral kind of community under that that is very vibrant. Um, and as things like vaccine potential mandates roll out, as Biden kind of rolls out different things for businesses, that fuels that fire and that robot, that audience is really growing. Again, you can target them across all those other traffic sources we just hit. Um, it might be different ways you do it, but if you can target that audience or kind of promote some of these offers or like the Trump coin offers, the different kind of, uh, you know, don't tread on me type offers out there, lots of free plus shipping goods and things like that out there. This is a very growing audience and we're going to continue to see that probably up right through till the next election cycle. So you've got years of this, which is still a very trending niche. Gut health, right? Um, that's been a trending one for 
year and a half now or so, and for longer than that. But if you kind of look at some of the keyword search results for, you know, keto's kind of going down, paleo's been going down for a while, um, gut health is really coming up as far as like a weight loss key term and things like that. So different types of gut health offers, you know, peak biomes on ClickBank, it's a great one. I think MaxWeb has that too. But there's some really good things out there that are in that vein that you can start tapping into. People are very aware of it or they're getting more aware of it. And it's very much more accessible now than it ever was. Crypto, gosh, I think today, as I'm recording this, I think it just uh, Bitcoin just hit 60K last night for a little hot second. Um, who knows where it goes from here? Very trending niche. Um, you know, there's a lot of charlatans out there in this niche, so you want to be mindful of what you're promoting, that it's actually quality, but there's lots of good, you know, kind of actual programs that teach trading and the kind of different kinds of ways to access crypto, or if you're even just doing it yourself, honestly, but that's a very hot niche right now. Just be mindful of it because it can be exposed to regulation pretty easily, so just be aware of it, but tapping into that can be very lucrative. Online education as a whole, this is a big one, right? You've seen um, like I think Kajabi or Klaviyo, some of the, or excuse me, Kajabi, you know, they were acquired. Um, some of the Teachable was acquired. All these big kind of online education platforms are getting acquired for good reason. People are consuming online education content way more than ever before, partially because of COVID, but also it's just trending that way. College is super expensive. People are realizing that I, you know, making 15 bucks an hour only gets you so far itself, even if you're making less than that. So. People are leveling up their skills or just their hobbies and interests with online education. We've seen this grow 30% on ClickBank year over year. Um, the commissions have come up 17% on average to an average of like 50%. So online education as a whole, if you're promoting courses and different things, can do really well. You just might, what I've seen with these, if you're gonna promote these, it can take more work on your part as the affiliate to kind of build out those marketing assets. Like can I really speak and sell? Because a lot of times a course creator isn't a great marketer, but they've built a really good course. So sometimes you have to kind of pre-sell it more than you might do with just like a pre-built lander that a vendor has and like a weight loss offer, but it can expose you to a great audience. And there's all kinds of courses out there, right? There's micro courses on raising goats or kind of raising food or hydroponics or losing weight, right? There's all kinds of different niche courses you can do and kind of layer on the back if you've built a list out, for example, on a certain topic. BizOp IM, make money online. We thought this was gonna flag as a crypto hit, or excuse crypto hit as COVID hit because, right, things get more expensive. People were losing jobs at a record rate. And then what we really saw is that government funding came in to give people more money, um, kind of like help bridge that. And crypto, or excuse me, BizOp and internet marketing kind of offers, make money online offers for lack of a better term, have really done very well still. So those are still a great one to promote. Those have increased like 17% year over year on ClickBank and it's already a big niche for us. So seeing that grow through a very big periods of uncertainty is a really good barometer for you. And they don't overcomplicate. The big three are still health, wealth, and relationships. How can I make more money? How can I lose weight? How can I find the girl of my dreams, right? All those kinds of offers are still great. As COVID has come back, we've seen the dating niche, for example, come back in a really big way, um, especially things that are centered around, you know, because people are so Gen Z or Y or whatever it is now, they're so reliant on the phones. They don't know how to actually talk to people in real life. So these older dating offers that were out there are coming back in a big way. Um, so this kind of niche can do very well for you. So if you're going through ClickBank or MaxWeb or these other networks you're on, you know, trust them to tell you what's working. If it's ranked highly, it's highly for good reason. You don't have to second guess it, right? Promote what's working, but don't be afraid to try these bigger niches outside of health. If you're kind of like, oh, if, let's say it's, you think it's too competitive or something, try the wealth, try the relationship pieces right? There's a, a lot of good offers. For example, numerology, astrology, kind of the woo-woo manifestation niche is a very healthy, vibrant niche that a lot of people don't consider. And it actually hits health, wealth, relationships just through a more loosey-goosey kind of woo-woo, if you want to call it, um, avenue. And you'll find that that has been trending up as far as people resonating with that. Um, so that type of niche, for example, can do very well because they actually hit the big three niches, even though it seems like a smaller niche in itself. It's actually not. And the same is true for, say, survival, if you want to look at that. A lot of the great survival offers out there are a blend of survival and health, right? If you look at Lost Book of Remedies, it's actually, they're teaching it like a survival book almost, kind of towards that right-wing audience. 
but it's very much geared towards like these are remedies that have been lost for ages that we've found are giving it to you. They're all natural and curing. It's very health focused. And so that kind of stuff can come across even, right? There's even survival niches out there that dovetail into wealth, right? What I mean by that, if you look at, oh gosh, Easy Battery was a great one a few years ago. And it was like how to repurpose old batteries and revitalize old batteries. And it had a very a money making approach to it too, right? Where it was like, you can actually sell these batteries. You can get dead batteries no one wants, fix them, sell them. There's a money making aspect or a saving money aspect, right? There's saving money on energy. So a lot of these different avenues hit on these three main key topics. So it might look niche, but you can actually open it up to a wider audience because they're hitting a big pain point like health, wealth, or relationships. So keep that in mind as you're looking for offers out there. Now we're gonna wrap this up. These, uh, I mentioned two specific podcast episodes. You can go find the link to our main podcast at the affiliated podcast link here at the top. Click go.clickbank.com slash affiliated podcast. I'm wearing the shirt. Um, we've got lots of good episodes out there. Kurt Molly and Jimmy Kim were the two I recommended um, specifically from this talk. There's a whole, I think we we're up to 20 or 22 episodes or so, so far. Lots of good stuff in there. Of course, clickbank.com is where you can find more from us. You can find me at thomasjmcmahon.com and all my social links there. Best one to follow me on is my LinkedIn, which my little QR code there, if you're scanning, will take you right to my LinkedIn profile. But reach out to me wherever you've got. Um, feel free to shoot me questions from this talk. Happy to help engage and answer as best I can with my bandwidth. But hope you've gotten some value from this 2022. I'm excited for it. It's going to be a great year. And we're just, you know, even though these trends can sound scary and shit change is always happening, you can always be adapting and loving yourself up. And it's really how do you work with the change and find the opportunities that come from it? Because honestly, we're going to see some I'm not gonna, how can I say this? Lazy marketers, we're gonna see the people that rely on tactics and hacks, they're gonna get squeezed out of the market. And the people who can adapt and grow are gonna have a lot more room to work with as these different traffic sources and kind of regulations tighten up as you, as you learn to work with those. So it can be a blessing in disguise as long as you can adapt with it. So cheers, happy scaling, and thank you so much, Max Webman, Anna, for having us. Bye-bye. <laughs>